everybody, welcome back, welcome back. I hope you had a nice breather. So, a question. Is anybody a musician here? A musician? What, guitar? Nice. Any other guitarist? Bassist? Nice, nice. All right, I think this next talk is going to be really interesting for you. We have Omar Diop, and I will leave you in his hands. Okay, now it should work. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And today we are going to talk about a um, topic that is, in my opinion, particularly curious because it's about music. And without further ado, let's start with the presentations. I'm Omar Job. I am currently technical lead at Learn. I'm a software engineer with a strong passion in building products. And Learn is a product company based uh, in Italy. And if you want to, uh, if you want to get in touch later, I can explain you more things about Learn because this talk is not about Learn, but about another project. In my free time, I like to go to, mo uh, to the mountains with my motorcycles. I'm a watch enthusiast. And one of the greatest passion of mine is bothering my neighbors playing guitar. So that's why we are here. <laughs> so let's see what we're going to talk about today. So uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, the project, which is a guitar tuner, and we are going to do a, a brief overview on the project. Then we will move on to the basics of pitch detection. After that, we will see the web APIs involved in the project. Then we will go through the implementation, the actual implementation of pitch detection. And after that, we'll go to see the data visualization part, which is only on the, the client. And after that, we will end the talk uh, talking about issues and possible improvements. So. He stole my question, but I am going to do it again. So, because I'm, I n I've noticed that a strong correlation between software engineers and, git uh, and music players. So, how many of you do play an instrument? Okay, quite a few. How many of you play guitar? Okay, bass. Wow, drums. Hmm, we need uh, a drum player. I wanted to do a band with you, but never mind. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first question is, do we need another guitar tuner? So there's plenty of tuners online, as you can see. There's applications, there, there are a lot of websites that allow you to tune your guitar, your instrument online. So the question is, why did you come up with another guitar tuner? Well, uh, I was curious about the science be behind that and the mathematics behind that, so I became curious. I started to study the topic, and I wanted to develop a little side project to test myself and see what I could achieve with, uh, with an implementation. So this project is what uh, the result of my, um, my research. And it's, I'm not, disclaimer, I'm not a mathematician, so be kind with the question after the talk. And, uh, but this is, what I came, uh, this is what came out after my research. And this is an open source project. It's called Perfect Pitch. And you can find it online. So in on my GitHub, you can go check the code. We'll see part of the code uh, during this talk. But you can even go search and look and develop your tuner wi with forking this, uh, this project or implementing it in other ways. So it's open source. Like I said, it's built with React on top of Next.js. And it uses the Web Audio API to gather the signal from the microphone and process all the signal and the music that's coming out of our instruments. The project is this one, so it's very simple. It's a, it has a really simple UI, as you can see here. I am playing the guitar, and I'm picking the, the right the, the, the string, and the note is printed on the screen, so you can precisely detect which kind of note it is. It's not, uh, it's not so, uh, it's, it, it performs well. It can be improved, but this is the, the topic I'm not going to about today, about, I'm not going to talk about improvements, but we will see later what can be done about that. So it's pretty easy. It runs on the web browser and even on the phone. So you can use it while you are playing your instrument without downloading apps. But that's not the main point. Let's start with some basics. So which pitch detection? The question was, do you play an instrument? OK. Uh, so we've seen that y a lot of you play an instrument. But I wanted to align everyone on about the topic. Because non-musicians could be, for non-musicians could be 
may be difficult to understand some concepts. So, as you can see here in this table, we have in the top row all the name of the nodes. And these numbers are frequency numbers. So you, you have to know that every node is represented by a frequency number. And on the left, the top left, uh, the, the left co uh, column, you can find the octaves. What are octaves? Octaves are repetition of the same note in which, as you can see, the frequency is doubled. If you go on the A column, which is the, the, uh, the main note that's used for tuning, as you can see, if you proceed in the, the columns, the, the frequency is doubled. So the one in the red is the frequency that the majority of the tuners use to tune the instruments. So the reference to, this to that frequency to obtain other frequency from other notes. Then in guitar, we have six strings or plus or more. And the, the goal of this uh, project was to obtain the frequency of each string in the guitar. As you can see here, we have the sixth string, which is an is a E note in the fourth octave. So it means that it, ha it has a frequency, a, uh, a precise frequency. So it's the same for every string in the instrument. And the other in other instruments, it's the same. If you have the bass, you will have four strings with different frequencies. So our goal is to determine which frequency is associated to every string, okay? Then we'll start with the basics. So you have to know that uh, the signal is may differ because we can have clear signals. As you can see here on the left, which is very, very clear, it, it, it's the signal uh, that's made with the A4 note, 440 hertz. Then you can see the right signal which is a guitar signal. It can be tricky because it's not, it's not so easy to understand. It can have noise inside it. So it's difficult to determine the frequency. So there's many ways to do it and we will go through them. So this is what I, uh, with the ones that I've studied and researched about it. And we start with zero crossing, then we'll see the fast Fourier transform and then the autocorrelation. That's the one that I've used in the, actually in the, the tuner. So the first one we have a clear signal. So the first method is called zero crossing. It means that you count the, the number of time in which the signal crosses the zero line in order to determine the frequency. So here, the frequency is uh, measured in hertz. It means uh, um, an event per second. So we have to divide our number of oscillations of the signal by, by, by the second. So how many uh, zero crossing there are in an oscillation? in a clear signal. In a clear signal, there are two zero crossing in a complete cycle. So once we have the number of oscillations, we count them with an algorithm. So here it crosses the zero line, here it crosses the zero line, we have the number of oscillations. Then we divide this number of oscillations and we obtain the correct frequency of the signal that we are obtaining. But could this work with a guitar signal? Mm, nope. It's cool, but it's very tricky to understand how it works, and it's a very tricky algorithm to implement because the signal is not clear and it's noisy, as you can see here. You can count the zero crossing, <laughs> but this is a reference signal. Not all signals are equal, so it's very different. Then we move on to the fast Fourier transform, which is a method that used by some tuners and in some tuners and in some cases. But even here, you um, with fast Fourier transform. You, it's an algorithm that performs a discrete tr Fourier transform in order, in order to convert the, um, the signal from a time domain to a frequency domain. What do I mean by that? By that in other words, here we have, again, the signal. On the x-axis, you have the, uh, the time. On the y-axis, you have the amplitude of the signal. So how the signal is behaving through the time. With fast Fourier transform, you convert the signal in, uh, you can plot the signal here like that, in which in the x-axis you have the uh, frequency, so the frequencies that we've seen earlier, and in the y-axis you have the amplitude again of the signal. As you can see here, there's a clear spike in one region of the graphic, and it's A44, 440, so the A4 that we were talking about earlier. You can determine by this graphic, you obtain a kind of graphic here on my left. But with a guitar signal or an instrument signal, which is some noise, as you can see here, there's a lot of spikes. So how could you determine which is the right frequency to obtain? You could do it, but it's not the easier way to do it because in here, there's maybe a, a lot of, um, other notes, so you don't know how 
to behave in that case. So this could be used, but it's very difficult to implement. So let's move on to this actual solution that I've used, which is autocorrelation. What is autocorrelation? Autocorrelation is uh, uh, the correlation of the signal uh, with a delay as a function of the delay of itself. So in other words, it's you um, take the signal, you compare it with the signal again, so you shift the signal during the time, and as you can see here, when the signal is equal to itself, the correlation is one. So from the top graphic, from the top signal, you obtain the following signal. So this is easier to understand. And here, for instance, if we shift this graphic, the guitar signal, and we compare it to uh, the delayed version of itself, you can obtain something like that. So it's very easy to understand, and it's not a tricky, gra a tri a tricky signal like the one that was before. So here, you can accurately determine the frequency by using zero crossing or every method that you want. So it's easier to do it. So you, you take the signal, you process it, and you obtain something different in order to process it better. So this was uh, the, um, the basic of pitch detection. There's uh, plenty of techniques to do it, but this is the one that I've used. So uh, we, I've used uh, web APIs to access the signal and the microphone. So I've used the Media Stream API and the Audio API from the browser. So it runs on the browser, it's very easy to use and to implement. So here, with the Media Stream API, you can uh, get access to the user media, so to the, the, to the camera or to the microphone. And with this method, you prompt the user to allow him, you allow you to use the microphone. So here, in this case, the left is the browser, on the right is the telephone browser. Then with the Audio API, you have a lot of interfaces. In this case, I've used the audio, um, the audio context, which is an interface that allows you to process and decode the signal. And combined with the analyzer, which is uh, another interface that exposes a node, that allows you to perform computations and calculation in real time with the signal. So as you can see here, you have the signal. In, in the middle, you have the analyzer node. And then again, you have the signal. The output is not changed. You are only uh, inserting a layer in which you can perform computations. And you can do whatever you want with that. Even here, it's using fast Fourier transform for other, for other methods. But that's not the case. So let's move on and see a little part of the actual implementation of the tuner. So the, I want to focus on three main files. Uh, browser RTS, which is an utility class that I wrote, tuner TSX, which is the main component of the, the tuner, and then pitch detector, which is a library where I perform pitch detection and frequency estimations. So let's start with browser audio. So in this class, as you can see here, you have the audio context, the analyzer, and stop. That's all you need to do it. So then you have this method that allows you, as, as uh, we've seen earlier, to access user media. So this is a pretty simple class. You expose two, uh, two attributes, so the audio context and the analyzer, and that's it. Then in tuner TSX, you create the, the class, the instance, and then we have this buffer, this float32 array, in which we're going to store all the data related to the signal. So with some method, we are going to put uh, this uh, information about the signal into this array. Then here we, we create the audio context and the analyzer. Then there's this method that's used to start all the tuners. So when the user presses the button, we, I call this method in which I create a microphone. Uh, so with browser audio, I get the mix stream. So I, I have the microphone. Then I set the source, so I connect the audio, uh, the audio context and which the micro with the microphone, so I can process the signal. So I do what I said earlier, so I have the signal, I insert the audio context, then we have still the signal, and then I set, I set a listening, which, which is a state variable used to display purposes. Then here, in order to start all the, the, the pitch estimation functions, there's an interval that runs, so it calls a function which is get pitch that we will see later. And then you connect the source. So what do I mean by connect? Source was the media stream source that we created earlier, so the microphone. Then we connect the analyzer to do what uh, do all the calculation and all the analysis that we want. Then here, this is a very important method in this function because this is the get pitch fun function that's called uh, with the interval. This get float time domain data 
is a very important method because it allows you to uh, have sound information converted into this float32 array, as you can see here. Every uh, item of the array represents the, the signal in a period of time. So you have, imagine the plot th that we have had before, like this, okay? So this is a plot, and the array represents this plot in time domain data. So on the x-axis you have the time, and on the y-axis you have the amplitude. Let's take a step back. When we call this function, that is the autocorrelation function, that the function I've used to implement the autocorrelation algorithm, the array changes. The value of the array changes. As you notice, you can see here they start from 1, they go from 0 0.99 period, and then they, they start getting to the 0 and then uh, goes up again. This reminds me of a plot, as you can see here. If you plot this, you obtain that. So it's easier to calculate the frequency on this kind of plot. And autocorrelation does that. So I can have all the data stored in my buffer in this form. So I can compute and I can perform any calculation I want on that. And then I get from the frequency, I get the note. So with autocorrelation, I can extract the frequency. And then I get the note and all the, all the information related to the note. Then we can set the note. And the note is an object like that. So you have the note name, each the, the top row that you've seen earlier, the octave, the column that you've seen earlier, sends off, which is the number of sends the note is off from the original frequency, for instance. If the frequency is uh, 40, uh, 40, 432 hertz, it's off from the original A4 frequency, which is 440. So it's eight cents off. So I calculate that in order to move the, the oscillator and the gauge that's indicating the frequency. And then the frequency number, easy. It's a number, so it's, uh, you, can, uh, you can use it however you want. Then this is pitch detector, so the library that is performing pitch detection, pitch estimation, and uh, all the calculation related to, fr to frequency. The main method, the one that I've called to convert the numbers fr uh, of the, the array to numbers between zero and one is this one, the autocorrelation. So the, this is the method used to uh, plot all the data into a readable form. So it calls autocorrelation with a lag, we'll see that after, and it called this normalized function. This normalized function is this one, this one, it's a function that performs max absolute scaling, which is a technique in which you uh, find the maximum absolute value of a series. Then you divide all the elements in the, in the series by this element. So you scale all the items in the array between 1 and minus 1. So it's readable, it's easier to understand, and you can perform every calculation that you want. So after calling this normalized function, we obtain the array that we seen earlier, between, zero, uh, between 1 and minus 1. Then, this is the main function, the autocorrelation function. So as you can see here, we are uh, performing this function rxx, which is the main autocorrelation function. And there's this variable called rms, wi which is uh, uh, the square root of the arithmetic mean of all the elements. And in, in this case, I've used this uh, technique, uh, this, uh, this calculation, in order to uh, filter uh, signals that were, no, uh, that, that were um, low. So uh, RMS, the, uh, the square root, represents the magnitude of the signal of a wave. So if RMS is under uh, a threshold, I filter out all the values because this represents noise, for instance. In, if I'm playing and some sound is uh, uh, not strong, I can filter it out and get all the notes that I want. So it's used to clean the signal. It's very... Uh, it's not so accurate, but it's uh, is easy to implement. So I, I went with this, uh, this kind of implementation. And this is the, uh, the function that we were talking about, the autocorrelation. As you can see here, um, there's this loop in which uh, n represents the number of elements in the array. So we take our array, we loop through the array, we um, sum all the elements in the array with a shifted version of the element. So as you can see here, audio signal n plus lag is the next element. So every time you sum the next element to uh, the array in order to autocorrelate this. So after that, you obtain the array that we've seen earlier. So the function, uh, the periodic function, and you can perform every calculation that you want. 
then once we, we have this array, you can estimate the frequency. So uh, I've could, I could have used zero crossing, the method that I've talked about earlier, but I went with another uh, direction, which is similar, in which you find the highest peak in the, in the plot. Then if you know how, many how much time has, uh, is in between the peak, a peak and another, you can easily calculate the frequency. As you can, can see here, this algorithm only uh, finds the highest, peach, the highest peak, and you divide the sample rate, which is the time between each peak, by the largest peak index. So if I have the largest peak, I can easily calculate the frequency. So I obtain a value of frequency. Here, this is another method used to obtain the note from the frequency. Uh, so uh, you can find, I, I inserted a lot of resources. If you, if you want to eat me up later, I've not came up with these uh, formulas, but are standards in music. So in MIDI music, or for instance, MIDI calculations, to obtain uh, all the numbers that we want. So to obtain the name, we have an, our array of notes with all the note names, and you can find um, with the module operator, okay, to the, into the array, then the octave, it's the same. I want to focus on this uh, method, so sense off, get sense off from pitch, which is in this kind of uh, form. So as you can see on the right, these uh, mm, formulas are, are standards. So you can find it them online, and uh, if you research, you can easily find them. I point out the resources later. So this is the exact implementation of these formulas in, uh, in code. So it's uh, very, very simple to understand. And after that, so with get MIDI number from pitch, um, you have uh, um, from the pitch, you can obtain a number that represents a note in another system. It's a long story, but I'm not covering that today. And get then the most important one is get sense of, sense of from pitch. So you have the base frequency, for instance, 440. You compare the base frequency with the frequency that you have. So you get the notes, the sense in which you are off. And even here, we have get pitch from note, which is the same thing. You, uh, with the note name, you can, you can get the frequency. Like this, okay. So if you perform this method, you obtain an object like that. Name A, octave four, cents of five, frequency 435. It's off by five cents. It's uh, very clear and to use it's very easy to use it even in the representation, which is the next topic. So data visualization, it's very easy. I didn't want to complicate my life on developing from scratch uh, an indicator or because I, it was a side project, it was a test project, so I wa didn't want to uh, delve into implementing a lot of stuff. So I used the e uh, an easy module that's a React Go chart in which you, um, you can display these kind of indicators by telling, it, telling him the, the percentage in which to display it. So it's very, very easy. Sense of two percentage uh, takes the, the, the sense and calculates the percentage, the percentage in which dis to display all the, all the function. It's easily customizable, very used. It's, uh, it's very easy. Then the same thing here. Uh, I display the, <laughs> the, the note name and the frequency by using my, uh, my object. So even here, there's no, so there's no rocket science here. And yeah, let's move to the final part. So the possible improvement. Since this project uh, that has been developed in a um, few, 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 let's say a week, so it's not, I not delved into uh, over implement uh, things, over optimizing, so there's plenty of work. Uh, to do for curiosity, as I said before, because I don't, I don't plan to build a product on that. It's only for research purposes. And one thing is to rest the indicator if no note is detected, because uh, if you detect the note, the indicator does not go uh, in, in the original spot. This is easy to fix. Then you can improve even noise cancellation and pre-processing. So uh, at first, you can clean the signal in other ways, using other algorithms, other filters, but is a completely layer, different layer of abstraction from the, the core project. Then you can even increase accuracy using other algorithms, uh, because I, I researched a lot, and I discovered that this is a rabbit hole. So um, pitch, pitch estimation is a science uh, that's been going on for a lot of time. So uh, if you want to study, you want to uh, um, improve your knowledge about that team, I advise you to go and check it out, to, to explore, to try, and to, to try new things out, because it's, there's plenty of methods to doing it. And this was one, the, what the easiest I came up with. So 
the choice is yours. I leave to you it, so you can go check out the, the project on GitHub, you can open issues, you can try to extend it, to implement it, to improve it, because it can be improved a lot. And that's it. Thanks for everything. And <laughs> One last thing, if you want to check out this QR code, in Learn we are hiring, so we are searching for curious developers and people that want to uh, co cover new technologies and develop a cool project. So if you want to hit me up later, I'm here around and we can have a chat. All right, any questions? Does this mean that if I use your tuner, I can finally play it through the fire and the flames without problems? Well, maybe we can use artificial intelligence. That would be really it. cool. Maybe that's <laughs> 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 All right, everybody, a big round of applause again for Omar. <laughs> this is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much.